Every business will go through a recession, a dip in both revenue and volume. Leads will become fewer and fewer, your closing rates are going to decrease, and you're going to wonder if you and your business will survive. Not only is this a very normal part of business, but it's a vital one. Being in the dip gives you such a unique opportunity to review your business model and work processes. You can make extraordinary changes today that are going to set you up for exponential growth and success on the other side. If you protect your business from the slump now, you can come out stronger, more powerful, and much more profitable than you are today. Hello and welcome back to my channel. I am Las Vegas wedding planner, Andrea Eppolito, and this video is by very special request. So many of you reached out on Instagram and asked for it. Last year during 2019 and before coronavirus was even a thing on our radar, I had presented this topic to the organizers of the Engage Luxury Wedding Summits because after enjoying such a great market for so long, I knew that our industry would eventually hit a downturn and I wanted everyone to be prepared. Rebecca and Catherine had invited me to present at Engage in Nizuk, and given our current circumstances with COVID-19, many of you have reached out and asked if I could share it. Now we had a video, but I wanted to give you something that was more kind of workable. And so today I'm gonna to walk you through the presentation that I gave at Engage, and I'm gonna link the videos that I showed as example below. We're gonna talk about how to identify the market and the signs that a dip in business is coming beyond just coronavirus. We're gonna talk about identifying the root causes for your dip and adjusting to the valley. And then we're gonna talk about managing and altering your workflow to set up future success. Plus, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how not to throw in the towel and lose it all. Please know we are in this together and I really do believe that we can use this time to work smarter, to be better, and to come out so much stronger on the other side. If you have any questions, I'm here for you always. Thank you so much. Here's the presentation. Done. This is Surviving the Dip. It was originally presented for Engage Nazuk in 2019 by me, Andrea Eppolito, and I hope that you find it really helpful, and I hope it helps you move through this very difficult and unprecedented time. You know, I've always considered myself lucky. I have the ability to work with truly exquisite, beautiful people that are very much in love. They allow me to bend the universe to my will and create utterly spectacular and fantastical rooms like this kind of over-the-top emerald green City of Oz wedding. Sometimes they let me bring in thousands of flowers and candlelight, and other times I'm not even in a ballroom. Sometimes I am on a rooftop and I am creating a crazy rich Asians wedding for people who want a really luxurious, amazing experience. Now, when it comes to a recession and how you manage your business when you're going into the dip, the first thing that I think you need to realize is that we in this industry are all unnecessary. And by virtue of that fact, we are all in the luxury business. Luxury is personal and it is very much on purpose. And so let's first talk about dips and recessions. The dip is coming. Whether you are just finding this in the middle of the coronavirus or if you are finding this 10 years from now and we are going through another economic cycle, the word recession has a negative connotation, but this is very much a natural part of life. Nothing is in a state of perpetual expansion. It can't be. Everything has an ebb and flow, and we need to be able to contract to right the wrongs and reset the world. Now, statistically, when it comes to the economy, the average length of an expansion of a boom economy is about 3.2 years. And the average length of a recession, the dip as Seth Godin calls it, is about a year and a half. Now, nearly half of all small businesses survive for five years, which covers one full economic cycle. But that also means that half of our small businesses are not going to make it out of the dip. When you move beyond economics and you realize that business, finance, and nature all have a life cycle, sustainability, creativity, and growth require that you and your business change. Creation requires change, and change comes from destruction. So this isn't something that I want to scare you. 
beyond COVID-19, the signs that you may be heading for a dip in your business, that you may be going towards a recession, are that your leads begin to slow. Obviously, right now, there are not a lot of people that are actively planning their weddings. The leads that are coming in, however, are erratic. And so you may be somebody who typically does full planning, and all of a sudden, you see that there are people that are asking for partial planning or just engagement sessions. You're finding that your closing rate is dwindling and that you're not wrapping up your contracts as quickly as possible. So when you look at your calendar, there are holes in your peak season. A lot of this is because decision-making on behalf of your client becomes more difficult. They are fearful in terms of getting to yes. And on top of all that, when you go out and you speak to other people, if you are a florist and you're speaking to a venue, or if you are a videographer and you're speaking to a DJ, many of your partners may begin to tell you that they're changing their services. This could be a very good indication that a dip and a recession are heading your way. Now, how can you prepare for a recession? Number one, and for some of you, it may be too late, but I always have what I like to call fuck you money. That is a three to six month reserve that will cover not only my professional life, but my personal life. It is in great times. It's like, oh man, I kind of want to take that money out. I'd love to like buy a dog or buy shoes or go on a vacation. But that money is your safety net. It's what protects you and allows you the opportunity to say, this is a bad client, I don't wanna work with them, or I don't trust this product and I don't wanna be an affiliate. It gives you the ability to make decisions rationally and not because you have to financially. Second thing, always operate on a cash flow. Now in our industry, this can be different because a lot of times what'll happen is during booking season, we'll have a ton of money come in and then we don't have regular kind of scheduled paychecks. And so when your money comes in, you want to break out your salary and the cash that you're going to have access to and you wanna stagger it over the next 12 months. It's really important that you only operate both your business and your personal life based on the cash flow that you have coming in. Because during a recession, credit gets tight. The ability to leverage yourself and your business becomes really difficult. If you've already had credit, if you have credit cards, loans, mortgage, anything like that, a recession is a great time to go into these places and ask if they will renegotiate your expenses, especially your interest, which will absolutely kill you. So make the phone calls and see if you can get anything reduced. And then lastly, you wanna manage your unnecessary expenses. Now note, I didn't say cut your expenses, don't spend any money. There are things that you have to do that are just a function of business. But there's a lot of stuff that you don't have to do. Perhaps you can put off buying note cards and only focus on having business cards. Or maybe you're able to still entertain clients, but you do something a little bit more reserved when you're dealing with partners. Maybe you don't need to spend so much on every single time that a new fancy toy or phone comes out. Buy and spend with deep intention. But here are the things that I do not want you to do. Do not go into survival mode. Standard practice in our industry is to start modifying services. So you'll see planners that have always been big weddings, full service, and full designers start debuting like month of services. Photo and video teams will introduce less expensive packages based on a shorter number of hours. Venues start to modify menus. This is what I call the only works. If you only want or only afford this, I'll do it because I only want your money. Survival mode is scary. Dumbing down what you do is never going to help. Even if you keep the lights on another two weeks or another 30 days, you are setting your business back. Your clients deserve better than you light. 
the industry deserves better. And ultimately, in a year and a half, when we come out of this, you're going to be behind the eight ball because you will have transformed your business in a negative way, not a positive. So please do not go into survival mode. This is an epic fail. It will commoditize what you do. It makes you one of many. Because what you're doing is you're saying, oh, I can be full service, I can be partial service, I can do full installations of flowers, or I could just do drop-off. I can make you a beautiful album, and I can do turn and burn, because don't you know that I am just here for everybody? Well, when you cast a wider net to be like everybody else, it becomes harder to be heard by the right people. What's going to happen is your art and your integrity are going to get lost in the minutia and in the very, very loud screams of everybody else that is in the same place as you. It's what I like to call starving artist syndrome. Um, Sean Lowe, he is the head of the BBC Collective. He refers to people in our industry as artists. Now, it's hard to talk about art when you're dying on the vine. And it took me a very long time to accept that what I do is art because I didn't understand how being an artist and being a business could coexist in a profitable way. But once you're able to sit with that and you're able to flip the switch, it's actually, it makes a lot of sense. And so instead of going into the place of being something for everyone, instead of being scared, instead of going into survival mode and offering a lesser version of yourself, what if we did it better? What if we look at the dip as an opportunity to change and to grow and to do only the work that matters? What if we took our downtime to build something new? Now, Seth Godin tells us that the dip is our opportunity to step away from the bonds of the past and the pre-existing norms and to really build something new, new process, new community, new mindset. I can tell you that a few years ago, I went through my own recession. It wasn't an industry-wide recession. It was just in my business. And I have to tell you, that slow time, the dip is where the innovation is. It's what allowed me to change everything. And now with coronavirus, we are all in the place where we can tear this apart and build something new. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to niche down. Niche is vital to success, especially if you're attempting to continue to attract a high-end clientele. When the bubble burst in 2008, the luxury market not only survived, but it thrived. And so the answer is not casting a wider net, hoping to get a little of everything. It's about casting a much, much smaller one because in the luxury segment, these are the people that are very well insulated. You need to know who you're for and you need to know who you are not for. And then everything that you do is about speaking only to those that matter. Now, why does this work? It works, number one, because clients are smarter and the investments that they make when money are tight, it must mean more. Luxury clients are going to seek out the best, the most prolific, and oftentimes the most radical. Everybody knows the cost of everything. They don't buy the cost. They buy the value. And so the more niche you are, the more deeply you specialize in one type of client, in one type of photography, in one type of video, one type of planning, the less replaceable you become because suddenly nobody else is as much of an expert in that place as you are. You're going to stand out so much greatly among the crowd and your clients are smart enough to see this. And so when you're starting to niche down, how do you do this? The first things first, you want to create a client avatar and you want to be very specific about who your client is. There's a worksheet that I use. I start by saying, who is my absolute perfect client? Danielle and CJ were one of the greatest experiences I have ever had in my career. They've been married for two years. We're still friends. We text, we hang out, we grab lunch. They are amazing. So I started with them and I said, okay, what are the age of my best clients, my best experiences? What kind of education do they have? For me personally, my clients are one of two things. Either they're incredibly higher educated in terms of having masters and doctorates, 
or they are completely self-educated and entrepreneurs. Where do they live? My clients tend to live in cities. They come from New York. They come from LA. They come from Toronto. They come from Dallas. Occupation, in line with their education, my clients are business owners or they are executives. What are their core beliefs as human beings, as people on the planet? As a human being, I believe that we celebrate because in life, bad things are going to happen. And when they do, you need something to look forward to and you need something to look back on. I believe that the grander the moment, the greater the memory. I believe that when you have worked as hard as my clients have to be able to have a level of success and a level of discretionary income, celebrating this moment, celebrating your life, and not just celebrating it selfishly for you, but designing an experience that allows other people to share in it, taking this one moment and making it bigger and better than everything else, that matters. And so my ideal client believes those things. I think about what they read. I think about the TVs and the movie and the art that they consume. I think about where they're vacationing, the brands they love, and their aspirations. I go deeper into their psyche and say, okay, who do my clients imagine themselves to be? What do my clients wish were true? And can I create an environment where it is? What do my clients fear? Why are they hosting this wedding? What is it that they value? What memories do they value? Because that's what they're investing in. They're investing in their memories for the future. And then I use those items, I use the answers to develop a personal brand. Because all things being equal, people want to work with people that they like. And all things not being equal, people still want to work with people that they like. You always want to start with your why. Why are you in this industry? Why do you do what you do? And how can you create a brand that lives these elements? How can I take how my clients imagine themselves, the things they wish were true, their fears and their why, and how can I take them and develop them into a personal brand? You want to align your brand and the core of who you are as a professional with the core of your client avatar. Simon T. Bailey, who I adore and respect, says people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think that that's such a beautiful way of putting it because when you are going in to building your brand, you have to say, who are you? I always say that I am timely and timeless. The stronger your personal brand is, the easier it's going to be for you to stand out in the crowd. Because your strength comes from your ability to communicate exactly who you are so that you can attract the right clients who align with you even in the slowest of times. When I think about who I am, the things that I love, I love fashion. I love shoes and jewelries. I'm a huge foodie. I'm always at restaurants. I'm staying at hotels. I love traveling. Well, what are the things that my clients do? They're big shoppers, they're big diners, they love to travel the world. And so when I go out as a brand and I talk about those things, I attract people who live the same lifestyle and actually, I mean, let's call it what it is. I don't live the same lifestyle that all of my clients do, but I still share the experiences. I still shop in the same stores. I'm still able to eat at the same restaurants. I've been to the same hotels. And so we have a shared background. And it really helps me in terms of marketing. When you're marketing yourself, do not cut back. I don't care how bad the recession is. Do not cut back on marketing. Cut dinners out with your family. Cut subscriptions. Cut your gym membership. Do not cut marketing. This is when you want to double down. Everybody else is going into hiding. You need to stay at the forefront and you need to be highly visible. This makes your marketing dollars more value valuable. It stretches them because there are less people advertising, and so you get seen more often. And you're able to be seen as a leader and as an expert. And part of marketing is free. It's just about getting social. Social media is such a given today, but we are not always deploying it in a meaningful way. It it floors me. It floors me and horrifies me when I hear people be like, I don't do social. How in 2020 as a business are you not fully deploying social media.
in a meaningful way. Creating content isn't enough. You need to have a perspective and you need to create content and distribute it in a way that makes it available and accessible. You need a content calendar and a method of distribution. So I'm going to show you kind of what I use here. Content creation. I begin with a topic that I think my followers will find interesting. Now, I've gotten a lot of calls and DMs saying, hey, can you talk to us about the recession? And so I was like, absolutely, fine. So this is something that I know you guys want. How do people absorb and consume content? They do it in four ways. They read it, they see it, they watch it, and they listen to it. Clients and colleagues are going to read blogs, LinkedIn, Facebook, and captions. They're going to see images that you post and that they pin. They're going to watch YouTube, IGTV, anything live, TikTok, and they listen to podcasts and audiobooks. And so I have created a different area that people will be able to read, see, watch, and listen to all of my content. Then I put together a calendar where I take my topics and I list it out and I say, this is what I'm doing on each day. And from there, I start to experiment and convert. Emergent vehicles like TikTok are a great way to get attention. And this is an old presentation. I'm well over 17,000 followers now on TikTok. You have nothing else to do because you're in a recession, because business is slow, because you don't have leads coming in. Jump on TikTok. Post a mix of videos. I picked up $7,000, 7,000 followers in my first 30 days. Now, the exciting thing about that is I converted 1,200 of them over to my Instagram. I met two new photographers and I moved 10 of the people from my TikTok to my YouTube. So while I am creating all of these other things, when I'm creating things for people to watch and listen to and see, based on this content calendar... I'm not afraid to experiment. And then once I start communicating with people, I seek to transition them over to my more established channels. Because ultimately, when you have your marketing and your brand together, you get to create a community. A community is a group of people that are bound together through the sharing of attitudes, interests, and goals. Commonalities are going to create a feeling of trust, love, and respect. Your community, your tribe is not going to leave you. They are never going to let you fail. They're always going to be there for you. And so as long as you've built them authentically, I think you are going to put yourself in a much stronger place because communities believe that people like us do things like this. And I want you to really listen to that if you haven't before. It's a big Seth Godin-ism. It's something we talk about in the BBC all the time. People like us do things like this. People like us, couples who enjoy an extraordinary life, go out and seek to create extraordinary moments for others. Businesses like ours that care deeply about managing your memories and giving you something to look back on, build processes that make it not just pretty, but smooth and fun getting there. Individuals in our community who believe in celebrating life, luxury, and above all else, love, go out of their way to support businesses that do the same. And so when you're looking at that and you're trying to figure out how are we creating these communities, with clients, it's about having real conversations. I noticed that three of my brides were consistently liking and commenting on photos and stories that I posted of each other's planning process. And so with their permission, I introduced them online and I connected them on Instagram. So JB was having a poolside wedding with an indoor wedding reception. JH was having a ballroom experience and AT was having an out-of-state destination wedding. I connected them all and let them talk. What do they have in common? Me. But now they have each other in common. And you can see this is actually a real snapshot. And it got them together talking about their wedding planning. This was about four years ago. And they're still friends. For my clients, I also said, okay, let's talk about the captions. When I'm communicating and I'm putting something out there for a client, and when you're communicating, I wrote a very long caption. I'm going to read it. 
your not-so-basic baby shower. Don't be afraid of using bold color combinations at a baby shower. This black, pink, and soft green color pal palette is both classic and edgy, with so many personal touches such as multiple chargers, white-handled utensils, and flickering candlelight. There's something magical about doing a baby shower, birthdays for little ones, and social events. It allows me to be involved in generations of a family. By giving me the privilege of watching a family grow, I am able to fully understand who my clients are as people. This is a huge statement. Seeing them in their homes with their families and friends, and by watching them in their natural environment, I learn so much. This insider information allows me to tell a better story, pull out personal purpose information, and together we can create a legacy experience that benchmark a moment in a family's history. This can only make for better events, more meaning, more moments, more memories. That is an actual caption to this photo, and I'm speaking directly to my clients. I'm telling them what I do and why it matters. For colleagues, I have aligned myself with brands, and I think that you should be aligning yourself with brands that really matter. So on the far left, you've got mine. Then in the middle, you have Javier Valentino, who does most of my floral production. And then on the very far right, you have Lavella Bridal, which is a salon that I work with very often. These are our three Instagram feeds laid out next to each other. And look at how similar they look. You can see that images that I have posted from one wedding appear on Javier's. That images that I have also appear on Lavella. Why? Because we're strengthening each other's brand and we're showing each other that we have brand loyalty and that we also have the ability to connect. When you move over from what people see to what people hear, this is where I want you to really consider starting a podcast. My podcast originally started on Anchor. It did not stay there, but this is where it started. And we started it here because it was free. So you can download the app on Anchor, you start talking right into your phone, and you publish everywhere. Now we've talked about what people will see, what people will read, what people will hear, but I always say that you cannot sell what you can't show. And so I had two videos in here. This first one, I'm going to let it run for just a moment, is the behind the scenes and the second video was the vendor mix. And so both of these videos talk about my wedding planning and let people watch it in a totally different way. I'm not gonna have you watch 20 minutes of videos here, but I am gonna link them underneath in the comments so you can go back to them. Once you have created content that people can see, listen to, read, hear, and show, you want to start talking about diversification and funnels. This is not about offering you light. This is about going back and identifying the needs of the community that you've created and filling it with great intention, with something utterly unique that supports your core business. This is when you get to create something new for yourself, and this is a lot of fun. I always use my own business as examples because, number one, I don't think it's fair to discuss somebody else's business if they're not there, but I also think it's something that you guys can kind of go and dig into and relate with. So in my own life over the last 10 years, I have found that one of the things that people really need is professional growth and they need a community and a place that they can go. And so about a year ago, I had created Education for Wedding Planners. It is a private Facebook group that is only available to people who have bought my online courses. So I have online courses that are um, business blueprint for wedding planners that teach you how to actually establish a business and how to start it. All the things that you are not going to learn in college, that you're not going to learn at your job. So when and how to set up an LLC versus an S Corp, getting the financials together. How do you start sharing on social when you have no original work to share? What should you name your business? How do you set up a contract? How do you talk about pricing? So that's in the business blueprint. And then I also have the, excuse me, I also have the master class, which takes the blueprint, and this is for people who've been involved in weddings for three to five years, if not more. 
once your wedding is established, once your business is established, how do you then take it up and how do you do something bigger? How do you do something better? And so how did I create all this? The first thing I did was I created free content. My podcast is free. My YouTube is free. I have a bunch of downloads that are free. Once I had people following my free content, then I started to offer them paid buy-ins. So the content calendar that I showed you earlier has a year's worth of topics. It used to be $97. It's been on sale recently for $47. And I actually think that for this time, I am not even sure. If you go to shop.andreapolito.com, I believe my husband reduced the price of that for us again. So the free content is incredibly valuable. If you need something bigger, you can buy in at a lower rate. Once you're comfortable, now you can go in and you can look at my wedding planning courses. So you can do the masterclass, you can do the blueprint, you can do them flat out, or you can stagger payments. I moved on to writing books. We have two books out. Redefine Your Wedding Business is about creating the business that you want wherever you are. And Luxury Weddings Las Vegas is such a celebration of this city and this town, the place that I love so much, all of the things that I've spent my professional life doing, and it's a gorgeous coffee table book. Those two things have been massive in terms of growth for me. The courses have allowed me to create a community where I can give back to people that I love and that I respect, and the books allow both the industry and clients to celebrate the work. And it's work that I'm so passionate about. I took those things and I also have Wedding Editorialist. It is an online self-publishing company that helps couples and creatives create 100% dedicated magazines cover to cover. The entire magazine is about one wedding or one company. Now, how does this fill a need in a time of a recession? Well, most people are not going to be able to spend two to $10,000 putting together a wedding album. But I believe that people need a thing to touch and to hold. And so instead, I work with their photographers and we build out custom wedding magazines. The setup, the printing, all of it, we do everything. And then we also put them online so that they can send them and share them. For wedding professionals, how hard is it to get published these days, guys? Digital is replacing print, and it's so hard to get featured because there simply aren't enough places to go anymore. And so if you're somebody who's looking to have your work featured, this is an advertorial place where you can go and I can work with you, my team can work with you, my editors and writers and husband, and we can actually put together a full magazine for your venue, for your photography company, for your videography company. And it's available in both print and online. And it's fully responsive, so you can flip through it, you can use it, all of these things. You can give it out as gifts to future clients, as marketing material. Every single one of these things that I've done, the magazines, the books, the courses, they aren't so different from what I do. They're still rooted in weddings and planning and design but they create additional funnels and additional places for me to work. And so what's next for me personally? Um, Q1 has been a little, bit, uh, a little bit difficult with Corona, but I am working to open up a new subscription-based community that's gonna do something for couples and colleagues. Based on the feedback from the people that I know and trust who already operate in my ecosystem, I think that this is gonna be super fun. And I challenge you to ask, What's next for you? What is something that is inspired by the business that you do? What is something that you find that your couples are always asking for, that one thing that again and again and again they say that they need? What struggles do you see your partners having and how can you help them get through it? And how are you gonna do it all? Because even though it's a tight time, even though there's not a lot of business, our time is still tough. And so I want to give you a couple of ideas on how I've managed to manage my schedule through all of this. First things first, task batching. 
This is the art of grouping similar tasks and doing them all at the same time. This allows you to get really deeply focused, thereby making you much more productive. So for example, I do all of my writing, my blogs, my articles, my books, I write everything in one day. Then I have a Thursday talk day where I already have a consulting client that I talk to every single morning on Thursday. I have my own coaching consulting think tank group with the BBC. And then afterwards, I tape podcasts. So Thursday is my day for talking. Monday is my day for writing. Tuesday, I take appointments. Wednesday is wedding Wednesday. I try to put everything out on that day. How can you batch your tasks so that you're doing everything at once? And now time blocking. Time blocking is the practice of scheduling all of your activities and to-do list items in one time block. So the goal is to fill up your entire day so that you have an adequate amount of time for your personal and your professional life. A time block calendar may give you anxiety. It doesn't, like I look at it and I just find such peace. People think I'm crazy. But this was the week that I had in November. So if you look at it, Monday through Friday, my kids get up at seven. From seven to eight, they own me. From eight until nine, I'm checking emails, I'm unsubscribing from things, I'm replying to clients, and then every day you can see my activities are color-coded. So Mondays, it's a writing day, it's a research day. My clients all get a how you do an email. They all get a state of the union with an update of what's happening on their wedding. I take a 15, 20 minute break, and then I go into designing creative and research. What am I looking to do? What do I have going on? And then at noon, I have lunch. Now I've left a three hour block there because a lot of times when people get into the office on Monday, weird things just pop up. So I have a break and then I pick up my kids from school and after three o'clock, they pretty much own me. Wednesday, you'll see Wednesday is a writing day. I have my kids, which are always taken care of. That block never moves. They always have to wake up. They always have to go to school. At three o'clock, they always have to be picked up. So you'll see that I've blocked out my time. When can I be productive? Where am I going at a certain time? On my Thursday day, I have my BBC call. I tape a podcast. I tape another one. I take a break. I have phone calls set up. All of these things, on Thursdays, I know I'm going to talk the whole day. On Friday, I know I'm going to be out. And because I'm going to be out and I'm going to have hair and makeup done, well, I might as well film for social. And I wanted to end this with giving you 10 tenets for success. This is navigating the dip. First things first, be curious and be open. Take your blinders off and look around. Ask why over and over again. Allow the answers to spark new ideas. This is where you will learn, where you will grow, and where you will create. Number two, be vulnerable. Being vulnerable is different from being authentic. Authenticity is saying, this is who I am, and I'm completely secure in this space. Whereas vulnerability says, this is who I am, and I have, this is what I've created, and this is what I want. Vulnerability allows you to take judgment that may not be positive, but spark growth. Always be a beacon of integrity, not just for yourself, but for the industry. Every time I hear of a wedding professional that doesn't do the right thing, I get angry and my heart breaks. You need to set the highest standards for yourself and for others. You need to live them every day. You need to demand that your creative partners do the same. Because it is only with integrity that you can build something strong enough to support you as you climb your way out of the dip. And be a perfectionist. Why? Because it's unattainable. Perfection is a lie, and yet it's the thing that we all chase. You're never going to get there, but the pursuit of perfection is going to allow you to push beyond, to grow, and to move the needle of your work and your industry. Perfection will rub people the wrong way. You may be considered to be difficult or demanding, but by being a perfectionist, you will do work that elevates your brand. Be constructive and critical. This is different from being a perfectionist. This is about review. Review the work that you and your partners have done. Ruthlessly explore the negative space and bring people into the process with you. You have to be self-critical first. 
Note that which was lacking, where you felt short, and how you'll strive to be better. Because then and only then will you be able to invite your partners in to do the same. And be decisive. This is about forward motion. You're never going to have all the information. Even right now in coronavirus, we are making the best decisions we can with the most timely information we have. Most of it is likely wrong, and that's okay. But it's about listening to your instinct. Your gut knows things before your head does. That's what's going to allow you to say, we have to move this wedding, or I think we can hold strong. That's what's going to help you say, I don't think this is the right client for me because even though they're willing to pay me, I can't do my best work here versus I need to go out and tackle this new project. Make a decision and commit to it fully. Be accountable. Be accountable. Own your business. Own your dip. Own your future. Shredding the paper dragon will take away its power. Free up your energy to focus on the new and the innovative. Taking responsibility, even right now, Coronavirus is not my fault, but I take responsibility for the fact that business, and not just my business, but the industry is in a place of turmoil, that the industry and our very lives as human beings, as people on the planet, is in flux, and it's up in the air. The sooner you take responsibility for it, it allows you to move past it because you accept it much more quickly. And once you've accepted it, I need you to be a risk taker. Our world moves fast. The information that is available to us is almost instantaneous. Opinions are formed so quickly. And what's scary is that collective opinions happen very quickly. And those collective opinions change the culture and the trajectory of our industry. Sacred cows are getting slaughtered fast. You need to be willing to try something new, to micro-test, to allow something not to work. You will fail spectacularly in many ways, but your successes will be exponential. Be optimistic with me about the future. Just believe that the business will provide because the business always does. The cycle will turn. It always has, and it always, always will. And last but not least, please be willing to walk away. And this is serious. I want you to be honest with yourself. Be honest with others. No one enjoys being in this place. It's awful. But we endure it because we love this industry. But if you come to hate it, if you hate the work, if you hate your clients, or if you hate yourself, then get out. Get out now. And if you see somebody in the dip who's doing all the things that I've listed here, who's creating new products, who's taking risks, who's batching their task, and they still can't get it done. If you believe that they're not going to make it and that they don't have a place in this industry in the future, be honest with them. Give them permission to put down the sword and to walk away. Success is not only defined by survival. Sometimes the biggest success is found in walking away from something that no longer serves you and that no longer allows you to serve others. Now, I personally am not planning on going anywhere because I love this industry. I love the people that I work for and the people that I work with. I am incredibly lucky and blessed and humbled to have you as a part of my community and my circle. I thank you so much and I promise you we are going to survive this together. So if you have any questions whatsoever, I am available pretty much everywhere at Andrea Eppolito. You can go and visit www.andreaeppolito.com. Until we meet again next time, my friends, I am here celebrating life, luxury, and above all else, love. Thank you so much.